legacy of India's partition. Um, you know, folks who are in the book writing business have these grand ideas about how their book is going to be launched and who's going to review it and you know how it's going to be received by the critics and most of that never happens the way that one envisions except in Nissid's case it actually <laughs> has happened in that way. Uh, some of you may have, have listened to, to his interview with Terry Gross uh, on Fresh Air and NPR last week. Uh, he, just yesterday, there was a very lengthy review of the book in The New Yorker by William Dalrymple. Um, Ahmed Rashid reviewed the book in The New York Review of Books, calling it a superb and highly readable account of not just the mayhem, but the political machinations that preceded partition. My favorite endorsement of the book is from New York Magazine. I don't know if any of you guys read New York Magazine. There's something in the back of the magazine called The Approval Matrix and they rank cultural items on two dimensions. One is whether or not they're highbrow or lowbrow, and the other is whether or not they're good or bad. And, and Nissid's book claimed the, the coveted spot of being both highbrow and good. Uh, so um, I think it's probably unprecedented for a book of nonfiction to about the have, partition. <laughs> about partition to have landed in that. So, Congratulations, first of all, on this great launch. We're really grateful that you came here to talk to all of us today. Um, Nisid, for those of you who don't know, is currently based in Singapore as the Asia editor for Bloomberg View. Pri prior to, to joining Bloomberg, he spent about a decade, I mm -hmm. think, at Newsweek uh, as Asia editor, foreign editor, and eventually as, as co-editor. Um, and, and the book is um, which will be for sale after this event. Um, we're going to talk for about 20 or 25 minutes up here, then just open it up to your questions. Uh, at around five, we're gonna end uh, promptly and we'll, there'll be a reception with beer and wine and hope all of you can stay. He'll be signing books, you all can procure books. This is also being, uh, being webcast live, so I just ask that uh, when time comes for Q&A, there'll be mics circulating. Please just identify who you are and, and keep your questions really short and concise. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we get started? Let me just ask you a, a question that I, I, I didn't really have the guts to ask you <laughs> two years ago when, I, when we first met in Singapore and, and you told me you were writing this book. Um, which is, you know, why write a book about <laughs> partition, right? I mean, in some sense, this is a, a, a period that um, lots of historians have covered. There have been some really interesting and fascinating uh, accounts of, of this tumultuous period in, in, in the subcontinent. You know, why did you decide, you know, aha, this is mm -hmm. the issue that I want to tackle? Well, it's sort of, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me here. This is great to, great to be here. It, it, um, it really grew out of my time at Newsweek. Um, that decade that I spent there coincided with the uh, American war in, in Afghanistan after 9-11. And I was in charge of our, our coverage of that, of that uh, conflict. And the question I kept getting asked by readers, by colleagues even, was why did Pakistan, this ostensible ally in the war on terror, um, you know, accept billions of dollars in aid from the, from the US government and yet still uh, allegedly provide safe havens to the Taliban um, and you know some degree of support depending upon who you who you believe and it, you know it made no sense to to someone sitting in in New York City but if you look at it from the point of view of Pakistan and how they see the how the security establishment sees the world uh, where India uh, poses this major central potentially existential threat um, some of their decisions became become clearer and what I wanted to do was sort of explain where the roots of that mindset uh, began. Not, you know, you can't say that it was all fixed in, in a few months in 1947, but certainly the two nations were set on a, on a course at that, at that moment that they haven't been able to get off of. And most of the accounts of partition up until now have either been, they're usually either stories, not really of partition, but of the freedom movement. And, you know, so the movie Gandhi is, is about all, all the years leading up to partition, and then partition's almost a footnote at the end. Um, or there are stories about partition itself and the riots and the, and, the, and the horrible tragedies that took place during that time. What I wanted to look at was, was um, something a little different. I mean, ostensibly, you could have had partition without having the riots if things had ha happened differently. You could have had the riots without creating a, a rivalry between two nations that you could not 
you know, that would last nearly 70 years. So what happened in that time period that set these two nations on a, on a you know, sort of collision course, as, as it were? What, what, what went wrong? What were the decisions made? Um, how, did, how did things play out so that this is where we ended up? So, so set, set up the story a little bit for us. So, I mean, the book is, is very character driven. You spend a lot of time trying to get inside the kind of minds of, of the several of the key protagonists, right? Uh, I mean, mainly Nehru on the Indian side and, and I think Jinnah. I mean, Gandhi figures, but I don't think quite as prominently as these, yeah. these two. Um, you have uh, a line towards the end of the book where you say that Nehru contributed very nearly as much as Jinnah to the poisoning of the political atmosphere on the subcontinent. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about these two men and what you see as their kind of relative contributions to mm -hmm. where the region sits today. Well, they, and the strange thing is that they were actually quite similar. I think they had more in common with each other than either of them did with Gandhi. You know, they were both secular men, they're British trained, you know, more comfortable in English than they were in any uh, Indian languages, um, uh, rationalists, really, um, scientifically minded, not, um, you know, uh, to, to both men, uh, Gandhi at first seemed quite mystical and, and incomprehensible. And um, in this time period that I'm looking at, sort of 1946 to 48, when I think the, the key decisions were made, it really was these two men who were making the decisions. And what was important to understand is that they came to this moment after a 30-year rivalry. You know, they had started out in the teens where Jinnah was, was a political ally of Nehru's father and was trying to bring the Muslim League and the Congress Party together to create a unified uh, set of demands to make up the British. Um, and over those 30 years, uh, they sort of fell out. Uh, Nehru, you know, uh, followed Gandhi's course, um, Jinnah went, went his own way. And they were, that's when their differences really started to come out. And, you know, where, where Jinnah was a uh, very cold, logical, you know, he's a lawyer, um, uh, very good at negotiations, and very fixated on sort of precise constitutional details and, and you know, arguing over this and that. Um, Nehru hated these negotiations. He would, he would just get frustrated in these hours of talks and would oftentimes you know, uh, come out with some impetuous outburst that would then you know, uh, destroy things. Um, so, so what I meant by that line was not that, not that either man was responsible for uh, inciting violence. Neither of them intended to do that. But with their sort of the fact that they couldn't argue, negotiate on the same level, um, they contributed to, to the embittering of, of relations among both their followers and then more broadly the communities. In India. But you sort of make the claim in several places that had the Congress been savvier, more inclusive, had Congress leaders kind of played their hand in a slightly different way, they, they could have gone a long way towards avoiding perhaps some of the partition, uh, the partition and some of the consequences. Yeah. Where exactly did they, in your judgment, go wrong? What were the major missteps? Well, the obvious one is the cabinet mission plan. You know, so one year, uh, about a year and a half before independence, the British uh, put out this last ditch compromise um, that would have kept India as a united country. Uh, but with a very weak federal government in Delhi and very strong provincial governments. And then the, the added innovation was that in the areas where Muslims were in a majority in the northwest and northeast, sort of the areas but not exactly where, which would eventually become Pakistan, that these provinces could, if they wanted to, um, form a sort of regional government um, that would have certain, certain powers. Um, and this was something that, that Jinnah accepted, um, you know, perhaps reluctantly, but he had been convinced at that point, this is the beginning of the Cold War, um, he, was, he was convinced that, that Pakistan on its own would not be able to defend itself um, against the Soviet Union, wouldn't have the, the, an economy strong enough to pay for its military. And so he accepted it. Um, Congress eventually accepted it. And uh, Nehru, who was facing pressure from his own left wing for having given up on the idea of a strong central government that would impose socialist policies on the rest of the subcontinent, um, you know, came out in a press conference with a, with a sort of, uh, again, one of these impetuous outbursts where he said something to the effect of that, that none of this mattered. Once the British were gone, you know, we would do whatever we wanted to do. And whether he meant it or not, um, he said it publicly. 
and and this this back Jen into a corner and you know in front of his own followers he couldn't he couldn't accept this and uh, he also you know legitimately would have a hard time trusting anything that the Congress leaders would would say from that from that point on um, and it's at that moment that I think partition became almost inevitable. Um, but were the, there were certain things that the Congress leadership did in terms of using religious symbolism, mm -hmm. Hindu appeals that Jinnah deemed were just completely exclusionary, right? Yeah, it was, I mean, this was Gandhi's great innovation, right? He was able to speak to the Indian masses um, in a language that they understood, but because they were predominantly Hindu, obviously the language involved Hindu iconography, Hindu mythology, um, you know, Gandhi himself was personally not prejudiced and he, he, he read from the Quran at his prayer meetings and things like this. But uh, not all of his followers were so high-minded. And when, for instance, in the 1930s, when the British uh, held elections and allowed Indians to, to control provincial governments, um, the Congress, because they represented the majority of the country, won most of the, most of the provinces. And the people that they brought in were their own followers, and they were, of course, predominantly Hindu. And again, I'm not saying that some or many or all were prejudiced, but if you're a, if you're a Muslim politician and all of a sudden the entire provincial government is, is, is controlled by Hindus that belong to Congress and they're giving jobs to their followers or their political supporters and so on, and you're completely cut out, um, that gave that fed a sort of insecurity that Jinnah was able to exploit. And, and, and he could say, look, this is what's going to happen if India remains united and Congress dominates uh, the central government. You'll, you'll always be cut out. You'll always be a minority. Um, and, and Congress didn't really, because figures like Nehru and Jinnah were so unprejudiced and really did uh, uh, you know, believe that Congress was a party that included all communities, um, I don't know that they that they understood these fears enough. You know that they thought you know, their Muslim friends weren't afraid of them. So why why should anybody else? So there was a sort of I think there was more they could have done to assuage uh, the fear legitimate fears of a minority. Uh, you know in, in India. So there's some really revealing sections where you you quote what some of the actors uh, privately said and felt about sort of Jinnah. So now if you turn the kind of lens around and, mm -hmm. and think about what were his failings or things he could have done better, I mean, you say that according to Nehru, Jinnah's Pakistan was mad and foolish and fantastic and criminal, a huge barrier to all progress. His profile was due to, quote, opportunism raised to the nth degree, pomposity and filthy language abuse, a capacity for what is considered, quote, clever politics, vulgarity, total incomprehension of the events and forces that are shaping the world, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> Mountbatten, who is the last British viceroy, says that Jinnah was a psychopathic case, unable to, quote, adduce one single feasible argument in favor of Pakistan. In fact, he had offered no counter arguments. He gave the impression that he simply was not listening. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why they couldn't negotiate, right? <laughs> this is, um, no, I mean, this, this uh, you know, he, he the, that quote from Nehru was from 1943. It was you know, well before he even got to the partition period. He just uh, could not, you know, it, it's a little unclear about what exactly Jenna was trying to get. There's, there's a debate, an ongoing debate, about whether he really wanted an independent Pakistan or whether this was a bargaining chip in order to get a certain degree of, of, re, of uh, political power um, as under that British compromise. Um, and it's impossible to say with certainty because he never made it clear himself, either in his private writings or to his friends or, or, or whatnot. Um, so he had to, he was in a position where he had to bluff a little bit. You know, he, Pakistan, there's a, there's a great quote from the CIA, actually, from World War II, where they descri describe Pakistan, or the idea of Pakistan, as a, as a, as a Muslim fairyland, you know, that, that this, this, this vague thing that means everything to everybody. So, so to a Muslim farmer, it'll mean that uh, your Hindu landlord will be will be booted out, or uh, if you're a if you're a, a, a mullah, it would mean that it would be a theocracy. If it was a, if you're a landowner, it would mean that you'd get to keep all your fields and so on. And it was he had to remain vague about it in order to keep this strange um, coalition together. 
Uh, and that frustrated people like uh, Nehru and, and Mountbatten to no end, and, and quite understandably so. I mean, he was a f chilly, chilly personality. <laughs> Um, one of his friends, one of his good friends, said that, that you needed a fur coat to be friends with him. <laughs> so was his insistence on a full, independent Pakistan a bluff? I think it may have been a bluff at first, when he started making it in 1940. Um, but then it's, I would say, by the 1946, by the time he, he, he gives up on this uh, British compromise, um, then it's a little more unclear. It's he... I think at that point, if he could have gotten the full Pakistan he wanted, which would have involved all of the uh, province of Punjab and all of the province of, of Bengal, which also would have meant that he got the city of Calcutta, which you know at that time had 85% of India's industrial capacity. It was the biggest port. I mean, it, it would have made a major difference to the Pakistan economy. If he could have gotten all that, then yes, I think it was no longer a bluff at that point. He, he, he wanted it. Um, but up until the very end, when he had to accept... Uh, a truncated Pakistan. It's it's really unclear. Um, it was the very the night that he was supposed to make his decision. He was still sort of hedging a little bit about it. So l let me sort of bring this forward a bit. Um, so a couple weeks ago, before the book was released, you you wrote a piece for Foreign Policy magazine, and I know you don't you know authors don't come up with the with the headlines, but the headline <laughs> was why is Pakistan such a mess? Question mark Blame India. Um, and the subtitle was... After, I also didn't write. Right. <laughs> uh, but now you have to live with. Yeah. Uh, after a year in office, Modi's gestures of conciliation towards Islamabad have gone nowhere. That's because India's founding fathers set Pakistan up to fail. What do you mean by that? So, yeah, so it, this, is, this is my karma for being an editor for many years and writing <laughs> provocative headlines for authors who are asleep in Asia. <laughs> um, no, what, what I was, the only point I was trying to make with that piece is that, um, you know, in this drama, a partition, there, there are no pure saints and there are no pure villains. Uh, it's very easy to make Jinnah out to be a villain, and there are, you know, I could, I could list the things he did wrong and things he was negligent about and, and, and so on. Um, but you don't hear as much about what, what people like Gandhi and Nehru did wrong, um, because they were personally quite admirable uh, people. Um, but I'm not talking about their personal characteristics, but what their decisions uh, did. And in that sense, they um, strove to, as, as I said, truncate Pakistan, to make it, to make it smaller. Um, they had no real interest in uh, making it uh, a sort of viable economically or stable, because there was this feeling that, and, and Mountbatten said this openly, um, Sardar Patel said this openly, even Nehru would say it privately, there was this feeling that, that uh, if Pakistan failed in a couple of years, it would then come back to India. And that this was just a way to get rid of Jinnah. He was an old man, he was ill. Um, and uh, uh, Mountbatten, in the negotiations, actually wrote a letter to his provincial governor saying, the key point, thing to do here is to make Pakistan as weak as possible so that it fails on its own merits mm. and they will return to reason and realize that a united India is better for, for everyone else. Um, and so there was, there was a, no great interest in, in making it stronger. And so you ended up with, and Jinnah would say, look, you know, this is, if you have this much of an imbalance, if you have this great power divide, you will have this Pakistan that's always weak and insecure and will be a destabilizing force in the region. And that's exactly what we've ended up with today. Now, you can't, uh, I would not blame all of Pakistan's dysfunctions on India, <laughs> let me just make that clear. 70 years have passed and many people have made many mistakes since then, but um, it was, you know, in its moment of formation, I think things could have been handled differently. But you do sort of point to a decision that Pakistan made early on, um, which has had direct ramifications 70 years later, and that's mm -hmm. its position vis-a-vis -vis Kashmir. Um, and you have a very interesting section where you talk about their use of proxy warriors mm -hmm. back in 1947. And you know, fast forward to today, and we're still dealing with this issue. Yeah. Uh, you write, Pakistan's unofficial support for the Kashmir uh, attacks, the insurgents, uh, was hardly a secret. And it marked the first use of armed proxies that Pakistan's leaders would employ throughout the country's history. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the decision making going into that, and sort of help us kind of play it forward till, till yeah. today. What's interesting, this is, I mean, there's, it's another, like, 
a highly contested episode in, in the partition drama where in October of 47, um, tribesmen from the, the Pashtun areas along the border with Afghanistan uh, went across Pakistan and into Kashmir, which was then ruled by a Hindu Maharaja who had not decided whether his Muslim majority state would join Pakistan or, or India. But he was starting to lean towards India, and, and uh, you know, signs of this were becoming apparent. Jinnah had sent envoys there who were reporting back to him that the, that the Maharaja was definitely going to uh, accede to India. Um, so these tribesmen, it's, the logic of this still escapes me a little bit, but the idea was that they would go in and spur a local uprising against the Maharaja, and that somehow that would then bring the state into, into Pakistan's embrace. Um, and this was, you know, there was a degree of organization to this. This wasn't entirely spontaneous. It's pretty clear that Jinnah himself did not order it, but um, uh, people as senior as his prime minister, Liaquat Ali Khan, probably were involved. Um, and the, the, but the feeling, it wasn't a, a, a sort of, um, they were trying to avoid an overt war with India. The idea was we'll use these proxy warriors, we'll maintain deniability, and we will gain at least uh, enough time um, to improve our negotiating position with India. So I, I guess I should back up a little bit. Once, once this invasion happened, India sent troops almost immediately. And at that point, Jinnah decided, yes, we are going to provide covert support to these, to these fighters. And, but the idea was that they would provide it for about three months. And that at that point, you know, someone, the UN or someone, would intervene. And uh, they would be able to negotiate a better, um, a better deal. Uh, and you know, for for a state that is you know inherently weaker, um, uh, the appeal of these asymmetric forces uh, is obvious. It's you know now I think Pakistan is now starting to find out uh, the repercussions of this and why it's dangerous to do and why it's counterproductive in the long run. But you can see why they why they would turn to it as a tactic. And um, it just got out of control. It it uh, it did because then it's you know over the next seventy years it become got tied up with a lot more right so then um, this was you know once once you're involved it wasn't resolved in three months um, then you you start pouring more resources into it and then you start to think that you can actually win this way and then um, you know they injected regular troops um, and then and then Kashmir of course just becomes this this great uh, cause to unify Pakistanis um, uh, as, as a way to, you know, when Jinnah, um, Jinnah passed away about a year after independence. And at this point, you know, you've got a, a state that's still like half formed. Um, you've never built up a clear identity for what this country is supposed to be. It's still separated by a hundred, a thousand miles of Indian territory between East Pakistan and West Pakistan. Um, and you need a unifying force. And this is when you start to get um, the idea that, that you know, uh, India is the enemy, this is, uh, you know, we're an Islamic state, not a secular state, Kashmir is this cause that, that we have to fight for, it's been, you know, ripped out of our hands by India. Um, it becomes useful to a lot of political actors and people in the security establishment to, uh, to continue this. Um, so uh, you, you say something very interesting about you know, why Kashmir mattered so much to India and mattered so much to Nehru in particular. Mm -hmm. um, um, and you say that, you know, much like Afghanistan would serve for the U.S. many decades later, Kashmir became the stage for a morality play. At stake was a particular idea of India. Um, if Nehru could facilitate the integration of Kashmir into India, it would prove both Jinnah and Patel wrong. What was the idea of India that he was trying to sort of preserve? That it was that India would be a multi-faith uh, society where where Muslims would be equal citizens, um, and and would be welcomed. And you know there were obviously there was a huge Muslim minority within within India, spread all throughout the country, but this was the only Muslim majority state. And the political leader at the time was an ally of Nehru's. And if and if the state would voluntarily join India, if its people voted in a referendum and said that this is the, um, you know, we prefer to join India, this would validate Nehru's vision. And, and it was a vision that, that Jinnah had fought against. Uh, Jinnah's idea was that Kashmir is a Muslim majority state. It, uh, it inherently belonged with, with Pakistan. And then Patel, uh, him and Nehru had, had been, through the riots, um, 
uh, under the you know the great pressure they were under, they they also developed a, a bit of a rivalry and. Uh, you know, Patel was more unsen unsentimental about this and sort of felt he didn't entirely trust um, the Muslim population within India, many of whom had supported Jinnah and had supported the Pakistan demand and uh, felt like they were a potential fifth column and that, and that if anyone expressed support for Pakistan, then they should just go there and, and move there. Um, and and Nehru had to fight very hard. To, to make clear that that was not the India he wanted to see. You know, it was not pop his position at the time was not popular. Um, he risked his life by going out and, and, and speaking in front of angry crowds uh, in Delhi, many of whom were refugees who had come from the Punjab, who had had relatives killed, um, and, and insisting that India had to be a state where Muslims would be, would be full citizens. So to him, um, in fact, I think the quote was, he, he, used to, he described Jinnah's vision of Pakistan as a, as a medieval vision, as a poisonous plant. And he, he described Kashmir as a, as a sort of thorn to, to, to prick and, and draw that poison out. That was his vision for it. And was the rivalry between Nehru and, and, and Patel, you know, his, the home minister, his deputy, the kind of other leading light of the Congress party along with Gandhi and Nehru, as fraught as it's often made out to be? Because there's a very interesting fight which continues in India, mm -hmm. but appropriating these figures, right? Mm -hmm. So in the current political context, Nehru is often seen as this kind of urbane, kind mm -hmm. of secular nationalist who was kind of, you know, a, a Congressite through and through. And Patel, even though he was a member of the Congress, is, you know, being embraced by the BJP as mm -hmm. a kind of Hindu nationalist and somebody who is sort of more genuine in some ways and more mm -hmm. rustic and, you know, right. um, and, and sort of tougher, this kind of Iron Man. Sort of how much of that is a bit overblown or how much of it is actually was borne out by, by the research that you did for the book? It was definitely borne out, um, you know, now it, within, within limits because uh, uh, Patel, there were always fears and rumors at the time that Patel was going to stage a coup and that uh, it, because he controlled the, the connections to the uh, Hindu industrialists, he controlled the money um, bags, um, and he was in, more popular at the time. I mean, it was not pop, the nearest position was not popular in the fall of 1947, early 48. Uh, and if, if Patel had decided to stage a coup, everyone expected that it would succeed, that he would, he would take over the, the government. Now, he never did and um, never threatened to. But he did find Nehru to be a frustrating figure to work with. He was too flighty. He was he was impetuous. He didn't. He wasn't. He wasn't a realist in a way. He had sort of had these kind of high fluting you know ideas about what how things should be. And Patel cared about stability. He wanted it to end the riots. He wanted um, you know he was worried about the, the stability about the of the Indian government. I mean, riots in in Delhi in early September nearly brought down the government for for a few days. Uh, so they would fight over, the, the fights were real, you know, they fought over um, whether Sikhs, for instance, should be allowed to carry the ceremonial daggers, um, which, you know, were being used to kill people. <laughs> um, and, you know, Nehru argued against it, Patel argued for it, Patel won. Um, and in each of these cases, Patel would generally, would generally win, but, uh, but in the end he remained loyal, and he did, he did you know, Treat Nehru as the prime minister um, when he couldn't take it. At the very end, he he, he was going to resign. Um, the day the day Gandhi was assassinated, uh, he told him just before that that he was going to leave the government um, and take probably half the ministers with him uh, and uh, change his mind after the assassination. And did their relationship improve after that? It did. And then there were tensions again later <laughs> too. Um, you know, there were tensions over the state of Hyderabad, which is a, a Hindu majority state run, uh, ruled by a Muslim ruler, um, and Patel just was again. He was the realist. He wanted to go in with tanks and, and take care of it uh, quickly. And Nehru uh, had more patience with the negotiations, but eventually came around to Patel's point of view. So let's uh, let me just ask one more question. Let's we'll open it up to the to the group here. Um, so fast forward till today, and mm -hmm. we're kind of at an I don't know. Sort of interesting point in the Pakistan relations. I mean, yeah. not much is happening on the surface, right? I mean, after a lot of hope and and kind of goodwill, 
when Prime Minister Modi invited the leaders of the SARC uh, governments, including Prime, uh, Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, to his inauguration, subsequently uh, the talks between the two governments were canceled. There seems to be no real movement in terms of rapprochement between the two governments. How do you evaluate kind of where the two governments sit vis-a-vis -vis one another, and, 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 and what do you think the case is for them to actually do things slightly differently? Well, it's, it's a hard case to make uh, in India right now. Um, you know, the Modi did reach out. Um, the, the, uh, the talks were derailed because, you know, Pakistani officials met with Kashmiri separatists and so on, sort of usual, usual thing. Um, and it is true, there's, there's a sense in India, I think, that, that there's no point in trying to heal this rift because it serves the Pakistani military for it to exist. This is, you know, having the India threat is useful to them. It, 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 it gets them, it earns them a huge share of the budget. Um, it, it gives them a central role in, in the governance of Pakistan, and they don't want it to, to end. And there may be some, some degree of truth to that, but that doesn't mean that you should just throw up your hands and ignore the second biggest uh, country in the region that has nuclear weapons and, and sort of, you know, make up with Bangladesh and Nepal and, and Bhutan, all of which is, is positive and, and good, but you can't just ignore ignore Pakistan. Um, and the, it is true that, you know, partition happened almost 70 years ago. You know, a lot of people say this is just history. You know, most, the vast majority of the population was born after this. But the conditions on the ground, I don't think are getting, I think they're getting less stable, not more. I mean, you have, you have nationalists on both sides. You just saw it two weeks ago. Uh, flare up of, of you know rhetorics, but still you know threats back and forth. Um, you've got twenty four seven satellite media that that you know just like channels here uh, elevates the loudest, most obnoxious voices. Um, and you do have you know two nuclear armed states that don't have a very good sense of how each of them would react to a particular crisis, um, which is very scary and very dangerous. And I think the longer this drifts. Without uh, trying to solve, without you trying to solve it, just the more dangerous it gets. But you made the point that you think Pakistan is perhaps changing in interesting ways in terms of its strategic posture. What are what what's the evidence for for that? In terms of in terms uh, of you know this use of proxy warriors of using supporting uh, militant groups that right, things right, that right. have aggravated India and Kashmir right. and elsewhere that right. perhaps there's now a realization that you know this is not actually uh, in our long term interest and maybe this right. is changing. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's changing. I know that they say it's changing, <laughs> and you know, I will I will take uh, take them at their at their word. Um, it's it does seem to take one example. It does seem uh, like Chinese pressure has encouraged them to be less tolerant of the Afghan Taliban. Um, but have they eliminated the safe havens that that uh, that these militants have? Not yet. Um, will they do so? You know, they say that this is this is um, this is the threat that they hold over them. That you know, go to the negotiating table, or else we're going to do this. You know, time will time will tell. Um, they, you know, they say all the right things. The generals say the right things about how they understand militants are the main threat now. India isn't the main threat. This is this is uh, you know this violence you know throughout Pakistan is is incredibly destabilizing. Um, I would hope they mean it, um, but but still need to see. So let's open it up. Um, my colleagues, uh, AJ here and Rachel have mics, and we'll just uh, start with, with you in the first row. Um, and just please identify yourself and keep your question very short so we can take as many as possible. We have about, uh, about 25 minutes. Thanks. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Raj Deep Singh. I'm with the Sikh Coalition, which is a domestic uh, civil and human rights organization. Uh, thank you so much for writing the book. I have a question from sort of a human rights perspective, which is, perhaps a little naive, but the question is, what do you think the prospects are for some kind of truth and reconciliation process mm. on the subcontinent? If it's not led by government, do you think there's scope for something like this to be led by civil society to help heal the wounds and mm. also open up conversations about free trade and people-to-people mm -hmm. -people contact and this kind of thing? I, I definitely think so. I think, um, you know, there is, a, like I said, there is, there is a, uh, there are elements of the state that have a vested interest in continued tensions. But I think if you, if you ask most average Indians and Pakistanis how they feel about one another, not about each other's government, um, the feelings are very warm. And, and I think people understand 
that uh, this conflict doesn't really serve anyone's long-term interests. And there are scholars on both sides who have you know, done incredible work with, with developing oral histories and preserving memories. And, and it would be what you need is, is those, for those efforts to be joined, right? And, and so that you can, people can understand what each side went through. But I think at a at a people to people level, there's definitely scope for that, um, and it should be it should be encouraged because it is conflict will continue until you create enough of a constituency on both sides that has more invested in peace than they do in war. And if governments won't lead that effort, then I think people should definitely. Uh, Deepa, yeah. Hi, I'm Deepa Olokli from George Washington University. And if I could go back to a uh, uh, slightly historical uh, context and then bring it to today. And specifically, my question relates to what you said about the uh, Jinnah relying on the <coughs> Pakistan military in the first uh, Indo-Pakistan war yeah. with the uh, tribesmen and how Pakistan military ultimately, the, the, the regulars went in. Yeah. And it became sort of the uh, regular uh, proxy war strategy mm -hmm. down the road. Did you, during your research, find any evidence at that time of how the uh, power balance in the political environment in Pakistan was sort of shifting from uh, the political to the military? Or did you mm -hmm. see any signs or any uh, evidence that, we are n that this was going to somehow uh, give the Pakistani military mm -hmm the kind of outsized role that it's mm. always had? Was there any inkling at all at that time? It's, it's a really good question. Um, the, the short answer is not, is not really because um, in the period I was looking at, it was a very tight period, just 46 to 48, um, and I sort of end with Jinnah's death. Uh, that entire time, the, uh, Pakistan's commander in chief was British. Uh, it was two different people, but they were, they were both um, still British officers. And uh, there actually weren't that many high-ranking Pakistani uh, military officers. So in fact, the, if you wanted to, uh, the, only, the only evidence I came across of military officers threatening or, or even thinking about a coup were Hindu generals on the, on the uh, other side um, who, had, who thought that the civilians weren't, weren't, uh, were, couldn't handle the, the chaos and, and thought perhaps the military should take over. So um, you did have uh, complaints when, um, when they signed a ceasefire at the end of 1948, generals on both sides all thought, well, you know, if you had just given us two more months, we would have, we would have finished this off. Um, so there was frustration, and some of the, um, uh, one, of the, one of the military officers who was involved in that tribal invasion um, was also uh, uh, tried, attempted the first coup in Pakistan in 1951. It failed, but it was his frustration over that whole experience um, that had caused that. So it wasn't, uh, you didn't see it, that, that evidence there, but it was clear that, that at that time, the military was the most organized and most established force in, in Pakistan. I mean, the government had just been you know, created out of nothing uh, in, in August, in July and August, um, and the military was still the British-run military. It still had its, its uh, you know, training and its orders and, and so on. Um, and so you could, perhaps have foreseen that this would be, this would be the case. But I, I didn't come across evidence of actual Pakistani generals thinking of, of, in those terms. Uh, yes, right here in the, in the middle. Hi, my name is Malika. I'm a graduate student at Harvard, and I study religion and politics. So this topic is endlessly fascinating and heartbreaking. Um, Mike, your book description says there's the partition created not only a physical barrier, but a psychological barrier as well. And I think that's true not between India and Pakistan only, but also for Muslim communities who stayed behind in India. Hmm. Um, and my question is, do you think the government in India, um, any government, not especially the, the Modi government, which comes with its own set of baggages <coughs> around this question, do you think the government has a role um, in dispelling that suspicions, those suspicions, and if so, what do they look like? That's also a good question that I'll have to put on my, my Bloomberg hat rather <laughs> than my, <laughs> um, because I've written about this for Bloomberg, but not, not in, the, in the book. Um, and you know, the point that I made in, in an editorial for Bloomberg was precisely this, that, that um, you know, I think Prime Minister Modi did a very good job within the campaign 
of, tr of keeping the debate, um, the rhetoric focused on economic opportunity and, and reform and economic growth. Um, and he's done a pretty good job since, you know, while in power doing that. Um, and so it's hard to point to something he said or done that, that you could criticize. But I do think that there is a special responsibility um, that the government and, and particularly a leader as powerful as he does has to reach out to, to a community that forms a major part of the country that does have obvious um, fears and that, and that it, you know, does suffer from, uh, you know, lower education rates, lower health, you know, all, all, sorts of, all sorts of issues that can't be brushed under the, under the carpet. Um, you know, does he, you can't, like, as I say, it, it, you can't blame him for, what, for things that he hasn't said, um, but yet you can, because I think it's, it's, it's any leader's uh, uh, duty to make all their citizens feel uh, included in, in, the, in the country, and it particularly be given his past and given the uh, suspicions of him and given the feelings about him, um, it behooves him to, to, it would have behooved him to do more early on. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to say what he could do right now. I think it's something that, that I would have loved to have seen him come out in the first month or so and just put this issue to rest with a, with a speech, with, with actions, but, um, it's hard to imagine it happening now. Uh, but uh, what about your assessment on, on, I mean, there have been various statements by any number of BJP leaders, members of parliament, members mm -hmm. of the RSS, the VHP, which have been quite majoritarian in mm -hmm. nature and inflammatory from the perspective of the minority community. Mm -hmm. Should he have done more in those cases yeah. where, again, he, it wasn't he who said those mm -hmm. words or made those statements or... Right. Uh, but he's, but he's but they're responsible. Yeah. No, I to I totally agree. I mean, the example I use, and I'm not saying this to curry favor with my employers, but I don't know if you remember after when there was that whole controversy about the Ground Zero mosque up in New York, and Mayor Bloomberg um, came out and gave a gave a speech about um, uh, it was essentially a civics lesson about about how uh, what it meant to be a citizen in the U.S. and how all all different faiths needed to be part of it and so on. Um, that's a speech that Modi has never given. And that takes a degree of political courage that he should have had. I mean, he had virtually no opposition uh, in, his, in his first six months. And uh, so it, I think it's, it was a failing in his part not to have done it. And he's paid a little bit of a political price for it because it's these statements that his underlings have made that have given the opposition a handle to attack him in the upper house of parliament and so on. So he's, he's you know, there is a, co a crude political cost to it as well. But I think on a on a you know, sort of higher moral plane, I think that there's more he could have done as, as a leader. Other questions? Uh, yes, in the back here on the left side. My name's Lee Akadahed. I'm a Brookings trustee. Um, uh, a historical question. Uh, I've always been struck by the fact that Jinnah died only a year after independence. So two questions. One is, how glo closely guarded a secret was his illness? Um, and I know it's difficult to sort of do counterfactuals in history, but if someone had known, if Mountbatten had known and had delayed independence, would events have turned out differently? Yeah. And on the yeah. second question, you raised the prospect in your book that the deadline which was set was actually mm -hmm. a deadline set for India, not necessarily for Pakistan in terms of this mid-August date. The handover, yeah. yeah. It was, it was uh, inc incredibly vague. You know, when everyone uh, complains that Mountbatten moved up the date of the handover from June of 1948 to August of 47, and it seemed a little crazy even at the, at the time, but um, the day he was in India... Uh, announcing this, uh, the British Prime Minister was meeting with the U.S. Ambassador in London, and he told him that uh, you know don't worry you know that that date is just for India because obviously India has a government they you know they could take over immediately, but um, but you know we're not sure about Pakistan we might do this later in the year it might, it might take longer than that so you know this was never thought through properly nobody ever asked the Pakistanis how they would feel about being ruled by the British for another six months but um, it, it tells you something about the British <laughs> mentality at the time. Uh, and on Jinnah's illness, um, everyone knew he was a sickly man. Uh, he'd been, over the course of the previous 10 years, there have been several times when he had had to retire to a hill station for a month at a time because of his, of his illness. He was a two-pack-a-day smoker, incredibly thin, and, and um, you know, I don't think anyone knew that he was 
Well, you know, a year before when this was all happening, he wasn't necessarily near death. He was as sick as he was uh, ever before. He wasn't diagnosed with tuberculosis until the summer of 1948, um, just a few months before he, before he died. And whether it would have made a difference is uh, a, a question that comes up all the time. And it's, uh, I find it impossible to answer. Um, if he had died, uh, say, in 1946, I'm not sure there was anybody else within the Muslim League who could have taken up the Pakistan demand and stuck with it as firmly as he did. And I, and I imagine there probably would have been some sort of compromise to keep India united. Now, whether that would have been a good thing or not, is, that's another counterfactual that, that is impossible to answer. I mean, there are many, many scenarios you can imagine where that would have led to violence later down the line, separatist movements, uh, religious tensions. You know, we just don't know what would have happened. But what about Nehru's health? I mean, at one point, you know, Mountbatten sort of muses uh, that you know Nehru is overworking himself to such a degree that he practically is not sleeping at night and is having real difficulty in controlling himself at meetings. Uh, he may be heading for a nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. right? And you document these amazing mm -hmm. images in the book, where you know, at one point. Uh, he, he gets out a pistol and, and, and starts brandishing it around right? when he gets enraged. Yeah. He, of course, there's that famous scene, which is in the movie Gandhi, mm -hmm. right, where yeah. someone kind of yeah. uh, makes a derogatory statement about the Mahatma, and he gets out and sort of you know, challenges them, you yeah. know, saying, like, you, you want to kill me first, you know, come right. attack me. And so there right. are these real moments of, you know, we think of him as this kind of calm and statesman, mm -hmm. but, I mean, there was real kind he was of a fire. He was a firebrand, yeah. He was more comfortable as a firebrand. He was... You know, when he came out of out of college, he was a you know European radical, and he always preferred action to sitting behind a desk or sitting at a negotiating table. And he had also never run anything, right? I mean, this you know, none of these guys had had ever held any executive positions. They were all lawyers, and so I don't think and and the bureaucracy that he now led had always been a British-led bureaucracy that that the Congress Party had been fighting against for three decades. And these were, you know, toadies of the British and, and you know, it took a while before he, you know, felt like this was his his government. So his first instinct was to handle everything himself. You know, the, the scene with the pistol is there were riots happening in Delhi and a friend told him about a particular area where where Muslims who were trying to flee to a refugee camp were being killed. And instead of ordering troops to go there or police, you know, he controlled the government of the second biggest country in the world, he grabbed this old dusty pistol and was about to go out there himself and, and handle the problem. Um, you know, that was just his kind of first instinct with, with these things. But again, it's sort of admirable, except for the fact that that's not what the leader of 400 million people should be doing. That's not how to be most effective. I mean, it meant that he was getting no sleep, that he was, you know, his house was full of refugees. He was, um, you know, it, it makes you realize, too, just what pressure these these leaders were under because um, they were surrounded by chaos without any real uh, institutional sense of how to, how to deal with it at the time. Uh, yes, in the back here. Uh, Jerry Hyman at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering if you could look forward a bit. Uh, can you imagine uh, how this could possibly de-escalate? What, what, what kinds of situations can you imagine that would uh, create enough interest so that these vested interests in, conf in conflict would maybe turn differently, uh, if, if you can? And yeah. secondly, are there any, is there anything, you talked about missed opportunities of various non-Pakistan and non-Indian <coughs> actors, are there any things that you could imagine outside actors doing that would make any reasonable difference? That's interesting. Um, well, my, my answer to the first question is sort of, um, the common one, which is that, is that you have to increase um, economic and trade and energy uh, linkages between the two countries. That, you know, South Asia, is, as everyone knows, is, the, is among the least integrated regions in the world. Um, there, is, you know, there are constituencies on both sides who would like greater trade. Trade is something like $2.5 billion a year now. It could be 10 times that. Um, Punjab in particular uh, would, would benefit from a shared energy grid. Um, there are logistical and infrastructure roadblocks to greater trade. You know, these are, these are issues. Deng Xiaoping always, you know, uh, his attitude towards insoluble so uh, conflicts over sovereignty was just to put them aside and focus on the things you can do, which is making money. 
And I think if you, if you concentrated on that, that would at least give you a, a few building blocks to, to move on from. Um, and in that sense, I think uh, the party that could be of most use here is China. Um, you see that they're investing uh, billions of dollars in, in Pakistani infrastructure um, for their own purposes, their own mercantilist purposes, but also while they benefit from a certain degree of tension between India and Pakistan, they don't want it to get out of control. They, I think they would prefer an India-Pakistan relationship that, that resembled the China-US relationship, where there was cooperation and competition, and you know, there remained some mutual suspicions, but that both sides w understood that conflict would be worse for them uh, than, than cooperation. And I think um, you know, if you can start to integrate Pakistan and India with Afghanistan and with China, you know, through, through um, roads and power plants and so on, uh, that could start to bind people together. And I think China would have an interest in that. I mean, they, they, certainly the Chinese, even though they've helped the Pakistani missile program and the nuclear program, they are as worried as anybody else about, about uh, the security of the Pakistan nuclear program. And I, I think they would prefer a more stable environment for it. You know, I mean, just to play devil's advocate for a second, I mean, from the perspective of the present Indian government, right? Mm -hmm. And their view is we are doing what we can. I mean, mm -hmm. we're working with those partners in the region who want to work with us. Mm -hmm. And that may be Nepal and Bangladesh and Bhutan and Sri Lanka and others. And we're working on, there was this deal which was recently signed about, you know, auto mm -hmm. movement, auto trade. Mm -hmm. And we're going to move forward on energy and a host of other infrastructure projects. And mm -hmm. eventually we hope that our brothers and sisters in Pakistan will see it fit to want to come mm -hmm. to the table and change their behavior. And so, I mean, that is their way of doing something with what mm -hmm. they have and, and hoping that that provides enough of a magnet, right, mm -hmm. to bring Pakistan over. But you're not uh, okay. particularly sanguine about that working. No, I mean, I, 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 I agree with that. I mean, I think, I think you know, the holdup here right now isn't the Indian government. Um, but at the same time, you know, while they're saying this, they're also, uh, you know, Issuing threats about every, you know, about how they're going to respond to this or that salvo across the border, and and you know, it's it's understandable politically why Modi and his government would want to appear tough um, towards towards Pakistan, but I don't think that that gets you anywhere with, with Pakistan. They don't, you know, that actually helps the army. This kind of rhetoric, um, so it would be. I think there are things they could do to change the rhetoric to sort of, you know, some of the. You know, India's already granted most favored nation station, uh, status to, to Pakistan, but there are other uh, hurdles to trade, these sort of non-tariff barriers and, and so on, that, that, uh, that they could work on um, unilaterally that wouldn't, wouldn't you know, really cost them that much. Um, and just, I suppose, make it easier for civilians within Pakistan um, to, who want to reach out. Now, whether they can or not, with you know, with the opposition of the Pakistani military, I don't know. I mean, it, you have to be realistic about it. But, um, but that should be the goal, I think. No. Any other questions? Uh, yes, right here in the front. Oh, Dan Liebman, I'm a writer. Did the Cold War warriors play any role in the partition, or try to play any role? It's, it's an interesting question because that was my original. Um, angle I pursued in my research, and um, I discovered after a few months that the answer was actually no. So I had to, I had to change my research a bit. Um, it, it was a context that I think influenced decisions. Um, I don't think um, that there was a direct relationship. But for instance, when Jinnah uh, agreed to this compromise plan for United India, it was right after he had asked one of the British generals of the Indian Army to do a, a, a strategy paper for him about, about how Pakistan could survive, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, the Soviet Union. And, and this general wrote in his report that it, was, uh, it wouldn't survive, that it would never be able to defend itself. Um, and that uh, helped convince Jinn at that moment that he was better off with the United, United India. Um, later on, uh, he tried to play up the threat uh, from the Soviet Union to, to uh, get money from the US. I mean, this is a pattern with Pakistan you know, since the 50s, but it started as early as 47. He was, he was trying to get a $2 billion loan from Washington, and his argument was that um, Pakistan was on the border of, the, of you know, Afghanistan, and, and Kashmir kind of touched the Soviet Union barely, uh, but that they would, they would be, uh, the 
uh, U.S.'s bulwark against uh, communist infiltration uh, in, in uh, South Asia. Now, the argument didn't work um, because um, the, uh, you know, the Americans were trying to you know, be even-handed with both sides, but, but he definitely had that in, in his mind. Um, and then, sorry, then one last uh, point. There's a, often a, a um, feeling that the British intentionally divided the subcontinent because they wanted to weaken both India and Pakistan, uh, which is not true at all. I mean, the British are, are, you know, can be blamed for a whole lot of things, but they very clearly at this point wanted a united India precisely because they thought it would be a better ally against the Soviets. It would be, you know, it have a united army. They could use air bases in what is now Pakistan to a attack the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, it would be a great source of men and materiel and, and, and so on. Uh, so their, their interest at that point was very much in a united India, not because they necessarily supported you know, one side or the other, but, but for strategic reasons. We have time for one more. Yeah, right here. Hi, I'm Sherry Arnabi. I'm with the Express Tribune. And um, so, yeah, you just mentioned how um, Jinnah was prepared to accept United India, and at, that was at a point where the idea of Pakistan had gotten a lot of fervor already. And so um, Jinnah's story on his stance on Muslim nationalism is interesting, that he started out not wanting to be a spokesperson for the Muslim community, and then he becomes the spokesperson. So how would you explain his shifting positions? Um, in terms of how he became the spokesman for the... Right, right. And then, yeah. you know, all of a sudden being ready to accept no Pakistan. Uh, well, you know, I think he... he uh, the, the, the turning point, um, which I, you know, many people have pointed out, was in these elections in 1936-37, where, um, you know, at the time, uh, there, there were these separate electorates for Muslims. Only Muslims could vote for Muslim candidates. And he had come back from England to, to lead the Muslim League in the campaign. And his idea was that the Muslim League would win the Muslim vote and then form coalitions in various provinces with the Congress. And Nehru, who was leading Congress at the time, just said, you know, no, we don't, you know, why would we want to do that? He had this idea that coalitions had brought down the Spanish government in the Civil War, and, and this was, you know, uh, they wanted to avoid factionalism and, and so on. Um, and he, and he said, if you want to join a, a, you know, our government, you have to join Congress. Um, and it was at this point that, that Jinnah decided that uh, Muslims, if they wanted to have a voice, um, needed uh, a, a, a sort of separate champion. Um, and he started to use, and also remember, he lost these elections badly. So he had you know, been a very powerful figure in the early part of the century. His political fortunes had gone down to the point where he was driven out of India and went into exile, came back, tried to make this comeback, w lost massively in these elections, um, and faced no political future. And what he did is he created a future for himself by um, seizing upon these Muslim fears and anxieties and using uh, them to say, look, I'll be your champion and, and, and so forth. Um, by the time in 46 when he agreed to the United, United India, it still is unclear, as we were saying, whether he, was, he really wanted an independent state or thought an independent state was viable or whether he just wanted protections for Muslims within a united, united India. Um, and it was, uh, you know, sort of Nehru's comments that forced him into a corner and, and, and forced him to sort of go for the more radical um, uh, part of that equation, that, that, that he couldn't face up to his own followers and say, you know, no, a negotiated solution will be okay because they could point to what the Congress Party was saying and say it's not going to be. No. But I mean, we'll never, con I mean, he left no diary, he left very few papers yeah. of value, right? So in some yeah. sense, this, your book is the, <laughs> the final answer, right? Will we ever it's, be yeah. able to shed more light on this? It's the, the, the difference between the papers that Nehru and Gandhi left, which are like extend a, you know, volume upon volume upon volume, and, and, and they're very, Honest and open, and and um, and then trying to read through the collected works of, of Jinnah, um, which is not something I would recommend. <laughs> Just buy the book. That's all you need to. Um, you know, the most interesting exchange of letters I found was was his arguing with the electricity company over how much they charge him for replacing a light bulb. You know, he, just, he didn't <laughs> he didn't put his thoughts down on paper. So there is an element of um, guesswork. Guesswork. Yeah. I mean, you know, you try and substantiate it by seeing you know what he was saying to people privately and and what he did, but um, it is impossible to know for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, let me thank you, Nisid, for, for coming here uh, to be with us today. Um, 
it's, I, I just, uh, just finished reading this book uh, on Sunday, and, and, and this is the most unlikely of beach reads. I mean, it is like, a, <laughs> it really is, it, you can feel good about yourself because it's literary, but it actually is, as, as William Dalrymple said, The New Yorker, reads like a fast-paced thriller. Um, we're going to now convene in the next room. Hope you guys can join us for a refreshment. Nisid will, uh, will sign some books. Some books yeah. You guys can buy some books. Thanks, mm -hmm. thanks for coming. Um, the gentleman asked about the Cold War.